Around early 1999, Shigetaka Kurita created Emoji. At the time, he was an employee at Docomo, the largest mobile phone operator in Japan. Speaking with The Verge, Kurita talks about the problems with many other mobile internet service platforms at the time, problems of confusion and lost meaning. Word-dense screens are hard to read, and short-form text-only communication make it unclear what people really mean. Are they being genuine or brusque? This is a familiar problem still, and and one solved up to a point with emoticons. But those have their own drawbacks. They're unwieldy, slow to compose, and non-standardized beyond just a few instances. Plus, composing a more complex and potentially nuanced emoticon, sometimes called a kamoji, using more than parentheses and colons, is for many people a pretty difficult task. What if, Karita thought, small, actual pictures were treated technologically like individual letter glyphs? In the way one types H-A-P-P-Y space F-A-C what if one could just type a happy face? Thus, emoji were born. Highly influenced, Kurita says, by Kanji's ability to, quote, express abstract ideas in a single character. Emoji spread to other Japanese mobile carriers and eventually the world. In 2010, emoji were adopted into Unicode, the global standard for displaying and transmitting the text of writing systems via computers. This is a significant thing. It means emoji, to a large degree, are controlled. One could create a new emoticon, kaomoji, or if one is so embiggened, even a new word at this very moment. That is a perfectly cromulent thing to do. But by and large, especially if you're a stock Android or iOS user, one must wait for new emoji. And when they arrive, it is a cause celebration for a couple reasons. Reason number one, taco emoji. And reason number two, as emoji have grown in popularity, they often stand in, much like animated jifs, for ourselves in our communication. And until recently on iOS, which for many people is the standard bearer for emoji, in the West at least, many emoji of people or body parts were emoji of Caucasian people or body parts. The weirdness is that if you are a person of color, this managed standard treated with no technological distinction from the text of your own language couldn't represent you. Emoji at that point stopped certain people from speaking directly and explicitly about themselves in their own language. The Unicode Consortium addressed this in early 2015 by including more racially diverse emoji, allowing more people to speak about themselves. But whoa, hold on, some of you are saying, speaking? Language emoji? Do these things even go together? And this debate has raged, especially after the Oxford Dictionary named crying face while laughing the 2015 word of the year. Are emojis words? Does the use of emoji constitute its own global pictographic language? Let's talk about that for a second. Linguist Gretchen McCulloch, whose blog All Things Linguistic, which is amazing, and if you don't follow it, you should, we'll put a link in the description, likens emoji to gesture. On Mental Floss, she writes emoji alongside emoticons and creative punctuation, quote, are the digital equivalent of making a face or a silly hand gesture while you're speaking, end quote. But just because individual emoji aren't words, does that mean altogether they can't be language or language-like? Nick Stockton at Wired says no. He says emoji are, quote, more like an embryonic language, a cluster of cells that might be a language someday. Writing for the BBC, linguist Neil Cohn says that emoji are not always embellishments, and sometimes strings of them communicate meaning, cf Fred Benenson's emoji dick, but really, the language question comes down to whether they have a grammar, a set of rules for how messages are ordered and packaged. Cohn says an emoji grammar is nascent, but there's also another big roadblock. Emoji are relatively large units of meaning. Insofar as they may become a language, we're back to square one, wringing nuance out of a relatively restricted system. Emoji may encode a small set of easily depicted emotions, but depending upon the platform, either cannot or can just barely talk about race, gender, or disability, and not consistently across platforms. Certain ideas about the world and people in it are incommunicable with emoji, probably by design. Emoji are an accessory to language, and unless those meanings emerge naturally, it's a restricted system, one capable of creating miscommunication, sometimes in light of largely unknown meanings. It is tough out there for an emoji noob. There are emoji missteps and emoji translators and those who say defensively so that they cannot speak emoji. Which brings us to the next step in this line of questioning. Emoji may not be words, they might not be language, but when we use them and otherwise communicate using the technology where they are available, are we speaking? 
The answer isn't yes, but neither is it a simple no. In all the fretting over SMS speak ruining the English language and probably other languages, there has emerged this saying, texting is not writing. So if texting is not writing, then what is it? Well, emoticons, Kalmoji, emoji, jifes, they all suggest that whatever texting is, we may want it to be more like speaking. Emoji and their kin may not be speech, but altogether they're an attempt to capture the aesthetic of speaking. This is what Gretchen McCulloch is getting at when she talks about emoji being like gestures, part of the verbal in-person speaking performance, which is made up of a few different parts that we're gonna talk about right now. An utterance is the smallest unit of communication. Generally, utterances begin and end with silence. But overall, their bounds can be fluid. An utterance may be a word, it might be a complete sentence, it might be a set of sentences packaged along with some ums and ahs and other fragments. More importantly though, utterances take place in a practical context. They are done, they're performed by a speaker in conversation, hoping to make meaning with language, yeah, but also other aspects of communication that work alongside language. Those other aspects are things like pitch and intonation, volume, facial expression, body language, and gesture. Not language as such, but important to the meaning conveyed by face-to-face -face language. Together, these things comprise paralanguage, the odds and ends of communication that work alongside language to help convey the nuance and further the meaning of the stuff that we're saying with, you know, words. Traditionally, utterances don't exist in the written word, only representations of them do. While writing, we're representing speech through text. But while SMSing or chatting, because of their informal, friendly, and often conversational nature, we want to represent not just utterances, but also their performance through text. This is what textual paralanguage does. Things like caps and weird punctuation, repeating letters to indicate phoneme extension, with emoticons and, of course, Emoji, what Peter Wilkstrom of Karlstad University calls animating features in his paper with a title that is best read, not spoken. We don't do this kind of thing with traditional writing because their represented speech is often accompanied by narration. Though, I guess you could narrate your text messages. Oh, sorry. All this is to say that emoji are not for writing or reading as words are, they're for indicating as performance does. To ask whether emoji are words or language is to ignore how they're used. To me, the literacy and interpretation of emoji work similarly to that of dance moves. They can be exceptionally literal, but also wildly abstract and still convey a recognizable message. Peach, hospital, and floating businessman can mean peach, hospital, and floating businessman, but pending context, they can mean much more or less, just like the whip and or nay nay. I'm not gonna do it. Emoji are linguistically and technologically, and in more ways than one, limited. To think of or use them like words is to recreate the problem that they were intended to solve. In the second part of Gretchen McCulloch's quote about gesture, she writes, you'd feel weird having a conversation in monotone with your hands tied behind your back, but that's kind of what it's like talking in plain vanilla standard English. Without emoji, our textual hands are tied. But we might also ask how emoji themselves tie our hands. What gestures can't they make? Or really, what gestures do they stop our digitally constituted bodies from making? Until recently, one answer would have involved some concerning race, an inherent and often inescapable aspect of our own physical bodies. Insofar as emoji comprise speech, that was speech that they couldn't represent. This, I think, is a great and exciting moment, as well as a set of challenges that come along with it. As the world's languages grow increasingly mediated and multimediated, communications which are not exactly, but which function like literal speech will be dependent upon technological affordances provided by others, guided by standards. Any gaps in those standards, things that they can't represent, will tell us an awful lot about who is making that technology and who in the world they expect to communicate using it, or the kinds of ideologies which shape their designs in the absence of direct consideration of the world and the 
people in it. The excitement in this situation is that beyond using language and speech, insofar as it is being made with things like emoji, the opportunity exists to make language and accessories to it as interesting and varied as the communities of people who will be using it. And I hope that we continue to take those opportunities. What do y'all think? How does emoji compare to the person-to-person -person performance of speech, and how does that relate to the fact that it is a managed standard, that it is a technological affordance provided by other people. Let us know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding pizza. If you want to watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. Special thanks to Gretchen McCulloch, who helped out tons with this week's episode on emoji. She actually gave an emoji panel at South by Southwest that is super interesting, really cool, talks about a lot of the stuff that we touched on in the episode. So if you want to give that a listen or see her slides, we'll also put links to that in the doobly-doo as well. Highly recommended if this is something that interests you. I was on a recent episode of the Mental Floss List show, so if you want to watch me talk about internet facts, that is a thing that exists. PBS Digital Studios is currently up for a Webby, which is super exciting for best science and education programming across the whole network. So if you want to go and vote for us on that, that would be super rad. And finally, this weekend at UNC in North Carolina, I'm going to be talking with a group of people who are doing a public media hackathon uh, to try to sort of talk through some of the problems and challenges that are currently facing public media. So if you're around and you want to come check it out, please come by. We'll put a link to all of these things, including the hackathon in the we do. One of the things that I really hope to talk about when I'm in North Carolina is the current set of very disappointing laws uh, that have just been passed. So that will hopefully be something that we can have a really awesome discussion about. Also, we're planning on having a small idea channel office hours slash meetup on Friday night. So we'll put some information about that in the Do We Do as well. It's going to be in uh, Durham uh, later on Friday evening around nine o'clock. So clear your schedules, come hang out. I'm also super sorry that it is last minute notice. If I had put it together earlier, I would have let you know sooner. So if, if you miss it, if you're too busy, I totally understand this is, yeah. It's a, a little quick turnaround. And the last bit of news, we're gonna be taking two weeks off, so the next time you see an Idea Channel video will not be next week or the week after that, but the week after that. So we'll see you in a little bit. And of course, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these crying while laughing faces.